My name is Whitney Louder. My husband and I have the honor to be the campus pastors here in Guatemala, and we just are so grateful for every single one of you. You're an answer to prayer. My husband is actually up at the campus in Zone 10 in the city today, speaking and preaching, so we're praying for him. But if you haven't met him yet, please come back next week. He cannot wait to meet every single one of you and give you a hug. But I have a message on my heart, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. Are you guys ready for today? Are you going to pull your notes out? Those of us note takers, I'm a note taker. I love to take notes. Like handwritten notes, though, are my style. Not so much the the cell phone notes, but whatever it is for you, I encourage you to lean in, whether that's taking notes, whether that's just focusing. Um, There's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on in our homes. There's a lot going on in our jobs, in our families, and in our life. And I think I know something for me personally is, Often, the enemy's biggest weapon or strategy to try to destroy growth, to try to rob me becoming more like Christ is simply distraction. Not even bad distraction. Could be good things. I'm thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about Christmas. I'm thinking about, you know, a lot of fun things. We moved houses this past week, which is crazy. Um, And we we thought, hey, this will be fun. Let's do this and, and have our kids be a part of it. They can help us, like, pack and carry the light boxes. And that was the worst idea ever. It was the worst idea ever because kids don't pack boxes. They unpack boxes. Amen. They, they, they take what you have, have so intentionally put away and wrapped and they unwrap it and they play with it. And then things you're trying to get rid of because you haven't used it in like three years, they suddenly decide they can't live without it. So the whole cleansing process just becomes useless. So we learned a lesson. Next time we move houses, we're going to send our kids off with somebody else. And a few of our lovely friends did do that, took them out to lunch and did a few things. We're so grateful, but um, distraction is something that the enemy can use to rob all that God wants to do in our heart and in our life. So I just encourage you today to lean in. I encourage you to listen. I encourage you to, to listen to what the Holy Spirit has for you today because the truth is I don't know personally what every single one of you need to hear from God today. Every one of you is in a different place Every one of you is facing different challenges. Every one of you has different prayer requests. Every one of us have different strengths and weaknesses and room to grow and become more like Jesus. I don't know what that might be for every single one of you, but God does. And I believe that even in my weaknesses, even in my imperfections, he can actually use the scriptures and the words and the messages to speak directly to you and your situation and in your walk with God and say, this is what I have for you if, if, if we want that. And if we are willing to listen, and if we set our expectations high. And so I just encourage you to do that today because we're starting a new series. We're starting a new series, y'all. It is December, and the name of our series is Joy. Joy. We're going to be in this series through the duration of December, through our Christmas services on the 23rd. And so we're going to be talking all about joy, the joy set before him, why we have joy, why we live with joy. And the answer is Jesus, but we're going to dive into more of that. The title of my message today specifically is, it's a party, or perdón, welcome to the party, welcome to the party, welcome to the party, and we're going to find out why. Let's jump into Luke 15, verses 1 through 2. If you don't have your Bibles, the words are going to be on the screen. It says this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Those are the first two verses in the, in the gospel, the book of the gospel of Luke. And, and I just thought it was interesting. I like Luke. I like Luke. I like his writing style. I, I feel like I kind of get him. Um, he's one of my favorites. He's often the book that we go to when we want to read the Christmas story and read all of that. But Luke, interestingly enough, is the only Gentile writer in the Bible. He was Gentile, meaning that he was not born of, of Jewish blood. And and I love this because there's no accidents and there's no details in the Bible that are not incredibly important because in the Jewish culture, the Gentiles, those who were not of Jewish blood were actually the outsiders. Okay. They were not on the in, they were on the out. They were looked at as less then kind of unknown, misunderstood, not as valuable. And in the Jewish culture, if you were of Jewish blood, that was being on the inside, right? You are the chosen people. And that was based in truth because in the Old Testament, God chose the Jewish people and made a pact with them. So now we're in the New Testament and Luke 
gets to share from a unique perspective because he's not one of the insiders in the religion, so to speak. He would actually be looked at as, who are you? Who are you to have something to say about all things God and religion? You're just a Gentile. And I love how God chose him on purpose because how many of us know Jesus came for every single one? Jesus did not just come for a specific group or type of person or age or, or men or just women. He came for every single one. And so Luke gets to share with this unique perspective because he understands what it means to be disqualified and overlooked and misunderstood, looked down upon. So at the beginning of this passage, Luke is writing Jesus. This is, this is something that really happened. Jesus is sitting with a group of sinners. It says, sitting with sinners, tax collectors who were like the worst of the worst. Tax collectors, sinners, outsiders. And really in this day and age, tax collectors were usually of Jewish they could be of Jewish descent, but they were kind of betraying their own people, extorting them for money. So they were like even lower on the totem pole here. And so he was sitting with these people, uh, outsiders, rejected, misunderstood. Again, there's no unimportant details in the Bible. And I think that we can all relate with this feeling. Maybe not currently or maybe yes, but the feeling of just kind of being on the outside or feeling like you don't quite fit and everyone else does. At some point in our life, I promise we can all relate to that. It, made, it reminded me in reading this of, of my upbringing when I was really from the time I was born until I went off to, to university. My dad always had to work around a military base in the United States. And so we moved every few years, just like clockwork. Pick up, move. Pick up, move. New city, new people, new school. And that impacted me so much as a child. I still have these, I'll call them core memories, these like core memories from first days of school. Because all, all of us know some kids are so nice. And some kids are so not nice. And I have these core memories of lunchtime, because this is always like the dreaded time when you go to a new school where I have someone to sit with. Am I going to sit by myself? And I have memories of being so, so grateful because that one kid sat by me or invited me to sit with him. And then I have memories of sitting in the bathroom, trying not to cry. I have memories of just wandering the halls so I wouldn't look alone. I have all these memories, but I remember so well what it feels like to be on the outside, to feel like you're not quite accepted or that some everybody else kind of gets it and you just don't get it or you're looked at differently and I think even in our lives right now maybe some of us aren't, aren't still in that time period of school and friend groups and things like that but we can still experience this you know maybe you're in a season where all of your friends are married and you're like the single friend the one who's not dating or not married I know when I graduated college I had four best friends and they all got married that year and I wasn't even dating and I was in all of their weddings. And it was awesome, I was excited for them, but I remember thinking, really God, like all of them, all of them this summer and every, every single wedding, are you dating anyone? No, 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 oh, you're the only one. Yes, 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 I'm the only one, I'm the only one. Me and Jesus, me and Jesus. But you know what that feels like? Or maybe in your friend group, you're the only one who's married with kids and all of your friends are single texting you at 8.30. Do you wanna hang out? 8.30, we're all in bed. Are you kidding me? I don't leave the house anymore after 6.30 p.m. That's like the latest, the latest I go out. Or, or maybe you just feel like you're in a season where everyone around you seems to be prospering. Like doors are open to them. They have visions and dreams and they seem like they're going someplace and I just feel stuck. Like, I'm not excited about anything. I don't have doors that are being opened to me. Whatever it might be, I think we can all relate to this idea of feeling like on the outside, the only one who speaks English, the only one who speaks Spanish, the only woman in the group, the only man in the group, whatever it might be, feeling on the outside. But this passage tells us that there's good news for all of us. There's good news for every single one, whether we feel on the outside or feel on the inside. And that good news is that at the feet of Jesus and before him, every single one of us are welcome. Every single one of us are welcome. And I know that sounds like a simple statement, but it is so foundational to our faith to understand that I am welcome before the feet of Jesus. And all are welcome. Why? Why are all welcome? 
because we all need the same cross. And that's another simple truth, but foundational one to our faith. We all need the same cross because we all have sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We all need forgiveness. And so because of that, we all need a savior, your good works, your church attendance, your service, your good decisions, all of those things do not actually justify you before God. Now, I'm not saying those things are worthless, that that is part of living a life, sacrificial life of God. That is part of glorifying him and living in his will for you. But, but those aren't actually the things that make you justified, righteous before God. Now, on the same side, maybe you're someone who's walked through a lot of pain in your life. You've had some difficulty or a lot of difficulty. Some people have betrayed you. Some people have hurt you, maybe abuse or or victim or anything like that. And we can even think in our human minds, because I have been through so much difficulty, God just has to give me a pass. Like I'm just justified before him because of all the junk in my life. And even those aren't the things that justify us before God. That is human thinking. God doesn't think how we think. No strength, no weakness, no line item on your resume, no past mistake can justify you or disqualify you in the eyes of Jesus. And that is why we need a savior. That is why we need someone to make us clean and make us right. And that is what Jesus did on the cross for us. He paid for it. And I know that this is sounding like, okay, this is basic. Yes, we know, we know, but you know what? I think sometimes we can know and hear, but our life does not reflect the fact that we know that our freedom, our grace, our new life actually had a price. It's not just something that we walk in and say, thanks. No, it is something that someone so much greater and bigger than us actually paid for on the cross. He took the sins of the world. He took every mistake that you have ever made and will ever make, and he paid for it so that that your behavior, your good deeds, and your mistakes do not actually justify you or disqualify you in the eyes of God. There's only one thing, and that's the Savior. When we say yes to Jesus, now God looks at us and he sees his son. He looks at us and says, you are righteous because of what my son did. It's scandalous. It doesn't make sense. It's not something we earned. It's just something he did because he loves us. And so in these first two verses, I see a lot here. He's sitting with sinners. He's sitting around the Pharisees, the religious. And verse one, I think, tells us that Jesus came for all of us and that he sits with us. He sits with us and he finds us exactly where we are. And then verse two tells us that religion is not actually the same thing as being justified before God. Because he's surrounded by these religious, the most religious of the religious, the Pharisees, and they're not getting it. They're actually judging Jesus and saying, what are you doing sitting with these people? And so that tells us religion and going through the motions is not actually the same as being made right in the eyes of God. So if you've ever been told that, if you've ever been told that or had that conviction somewhere deep inside you that, that if I just get here, if I could just stop this, then God will finally see me this way. I just want to tell you, read this passage, look at this passage, meditate on this passage. Because Jesus, as he's sitting here, he begins to tell some parables. Parables are stories that, that are really imagery to, to represent a spiritual and biblical truth. And Jesus used these a lot. He was, I I like to think that Jesus was somewhat of a poet and an author. He used this beautiful imagery to make spiritual things that were maybe kind of hard for people to take hold of. He made them super real so that people in that time and age could grab hold of something. And so he talks about, he talks about a, a, a shepherd who's looking for a lost sheep in this passage. He talks about a woman who is looking for a lost coin. And, and the theme of all of it is that there is something important Something that someone has placed great value on that is lost and the owner is doing everything in their possibility to find that one thing. So this is the theme. This is the theme. And I think we can relate to this on a, on a smaller level in our day and age. When we lose our cell phone, when we lose our keys, we do not just say, oh, well, like, I guess I'll go buy a new one not a big deal. We look for those things. And I know who are the people here who lose their phone three times a day? Five. Yeah. 
I think there's more than that. Or if it's not you, you're probably married to the person who does that, right? I'm that person, and Nate finds my phone for me three times a day. I'm also the person that every time we get in the car or leave the house, um, he's like, do you have your phone? And I'm just like, no, I don't have it. I don't have it. And he runs back and gets it for me. He's, he's the better of us for sure. He's amazing. But we understand the idea of having something valuable to us. And we do everything, everything in our power to find that thing. And we don't give up until we find it. And so he's making this real. Jesus is making it real for their time and their day. When something valuable is lost, you look for it. When something is important to your heart, you look for it. When something, when something... And I think this is so interesting. It's important to realize that Jesus isn't just talking to one group of people here. He's actually talking to three, three groups of people. Number one, Jesus is speaking to the sinners with whom he is sitting. He's speaking to them. Jesus is also speaking to the religious leaders who are listening and judging him and angry with him. And number three, Jesus is speaking to us. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. He's speaking to every single person who he knew would hear this story in the future. He's speaking to all of us. He was speaking to them in the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the parable of the lost son. And this is one of my favorite, favorite parables in the entire Bible, the prodigal son. Many of us are familiar with it or at least know the concept But I want to read this, Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus is continuing talking to this group in parables. He says, there was a man, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Um, I feel like so much is actually said in so little here about what's happening. Jesus is saying there's a father. And we can assume that this father is, is somewhat successful. He has possessions. He has land. He has, he has servants. He has money. He has an inheritance to leave his two sons. But the younger son decides he doesn't want to wait. He doesn't want the proper thing at that time would be to wait until the appointed time to get the inheritance and kind of step in. And it would have been later in life, but he decides, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want the mess of living in your house. I don't want responsibilities. I just want my money and I want to go pursue the things that I want to pursue. I want my way, not your way. I want my will, not your will. I know better than you, my time, my place, my way, my dreams. Sound familiar? My way. So he takes it and leaves. And this would be like probably the most offensive and hurtful thing you could possibly do to a father, someone who's loved you and provided for you and wants to give you an inheritance to say, I don't want you. I just want your money. Bye. Can you imagine the pain and the betrayal, but the father gives it to him. And so this son is the one that has so much potential. I can just picture it. So many talents, potential doors open to him, but he just throws it away. And for what? for his own will and his own things like we talked about. And I think that some of us can relate to this in a really tangible way right now in our lives. Maybe some of us here are parents who have a child who is going their own way and making decisions and we can see it so clearly that's not what's best for you. That's not going to be what's good for you. But, but we also just feel helpless. Like all we can do is pray and love you, but I can't actually make you do the right thing. You can relate to that feeling of seeing all this potential, all of these open doors, but they're not walking through it. Or maybe you just have a family member, a friend, a loved one, and you see all of the beauty and purpose in their life. You look at their life, you look at them and say, wow, look at what God has done in you. Look at, look at the potential that he has for you. But when they look at themselves, all they see is failure. All they see is less than, all they see is disappointment, and so they isolate and they lose hope, and you're looking at them like, it could be this. But yet, after prayer and loving them and doing what we can, ultimately they have to take a step. So I think we can relate to this idea of a prodigal son, someone who's not walking in the fullness. And, you know, this is the parable of the prodigal son, like I said, and I think that when we hear this parable, we think that he is the main character right? That the prodigal son, him and the father, he leaves and makes bad decisions. He ends up sleeping with the pigs. And then those of us who know the story know that there's actually a good ending though. Later on, he comes home. He decides, I don't want this. I want my father's house. There is hope and there's a happy ending. But this is not just a story. We're going to talk more about the younger son later. This is not just a story about a son who runs away and then returns home. It is also a story about another son the older son who stays, but he still thinks like a slave. 
And I think we can think that the older son is kind of like a side character, like he just makes his little appearance, hey, like a little moral of the story, but it's really about the younger son. But I actually don't think that's true. I think that that Jesus knew in all his wisdom, I'm talking to both groups right here, and one is not better than the other. It's just a different struggle and a different sin. But I'm going to talk to both of you here. So I want to talk about this older son who actually stayed but is still thinking like a slave and not understanding what it means to live in the father's house. So let's focus on him for a second. Luke 15 verse 25 through 30 says this, talking about the older son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, this was after the younger son returned back home. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Good news. He's come home. He's alive. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, this idiot that's kind of what he's saying this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home you kill the fattened calf for him can you hear the tone for him and not me for him and i feel like again i can oh i can i know this guy because i think i've seen him in myself this is the older brother i'm a mad firstborn some of us firstborns i'm not firstborn but i have a firstborn he wants to achieve He wants to do the right thing. He wants to be the good big brother. He's been there. He's put in the time. He's been working in the field. I imagine he wants the affirmation and and applause from his father more than he wants anything else in the world. And he's just been slaving and slaving and doing the right thing. Never staying out too late. Never never going off with his friends. He's like, I'm going to do the thing and I'm going to be the good big brother. I'm going to do this. And you can imagine with that mindset what he might feel in seeing his younger brother, who's an idiot and done all of the things wrong. He probably had to work twice as hard because his brother wasn't there with him. And then he sees him get a party. He's like, you've got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. And so his response is very different from his father's response when his brother comes back. He's not joyful. He's not excited. He's not celebrating he's not grateful he doesn't even seem relieved i mean they didn't know if this guy was alive or dead he doesn't even care he's not even relieved instead what do we see we see anger jealousy comparison and a deep desire to be affirmed like but what about you see him and not me He's done that, but I've done this. It's it's all of these things coming out of him. And and what struck me here is how different the response of the father was at the homecoming and the response of the older son. He's like, all these years I've been slaving, like in verses 29 and 30. All of these years I have done all these things. I never got a party. This screw-up gets a party. And then the father, his response to him in verse 31, he says, my son, He's reminding him of his identity. That's not an accident. My son, this is who you are. The father said, you are always with me. Everything I have, every single thing that belongs to me belongs to you. Everything that's mine is yours. So the father is saying to this older son, you can have a party anytime you want to. Just let me know. You have access to everything I have. But actually, you're seeing it wrong because you living here in my house is actually the prize you seek. And you already have it. You're just not recognizing it. Verse 28, I'm backing up just a little bit because this is important. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out to him. It's another important detail. His father went out and pleaded with him. And notice how the father went out and moved towards the older son who was acting this way. He didn't leave him out there. He didn't say, oh, he'll get over it. He'll come to his senses. He went out to him. And what does this tell me? This tells me that when you and I are the older son, when you and I are in a state of anger and jealousy and comparison and not seeing things clearly and only seeing what we want, when you and I are in a state of hypocrisy, that Jesus 
still chases us, that he still comes towards us, that he's not mad at us. Instead, he has a deep desire for you and I to see correctly our identity and see not only how we see us, but see how he sees us. He is pleading with us. Can't you see, son, daughter, you are my child because someone else gets love doesn't mean you have less. Everything I have belongs to you. And again, I think that when we hear this story, maybe the prodigal son doesn't apply to us too much or we don't feel like it does. And we're like, no, that's not me. I'm, I'm living my life for Jesus. And then we look at the older son. That's not me. I'm happy for everyone. But you know what? I think that, that the two of these apply to both of us in one way. And I think that this older brother mentality is one that those of us who maybe have known God for a long time can slip into so incredibly easily without even realizing it. And we start living our life and serving at church and serving our spouses and going through the motions secretly in our head, kind of keeping score with God and saying, you know what? I've earned this. I've earned these open doors. And then you see someone who claims to know Jesus and love Jesus and you say, they're acting like that? They posted that thing. They said that behind my back. Are you kidding me? And I, they've had all these doors open to them and I haven't had any doors open to me. They're living that way and I'm living this way. I'm doing the right thing. Are you kidding me, God? Like, how have I not had more doors open to me? How come my life isn't easier? How come I haven't met the man or met the woman yet? How come I don't have my dream job? How come my Instagram photos don't look like their Instagram photos? How come all of these things, I'm living for you, I'm doing the right thing. Are you kidding me? And I think without maybe wanting to admit it, that can be a posture in our heart. And you know, I think a connection with the spirit of the older brother, which is really a spirit of striving, again, wanting our actions and our good deeds and how good we are to actually make us justified and affirm us before God, a connection of that striving spirit is actually comparison and criticism and anger. They always go together. You can't live with this striving spirit of achieving for God and not also eventually adopt the spirit of comparison and jealousy and criticism and anger. They go hand in hand, and then we find ourselves unable, unable to celebrate someone else's victory, unable to love someone who is a hot mess because we feel like they kind of deserve what's coming to them, unable to celebrate, and instead we're criticizing and making judgments This is the older brother mentality. And I think that when we find ourselves in that place, we need to stop and say, no, 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 no. That's the older brother. Okay. That's how an older brother would think. God doesn't call me to have the heart of an older brother. He calls me to have the heart of the father. He calls me to celebrate, not to criticize. He calls me to say, welcome home. Not, I'm not going in there. We are called to replicate the heart of the father. But so often We can be the older brother. And so I just want to encourage us. Don't forget how the father moved towards you. When you see someone else in their lowest low, when you see someone else who's really made a mess of their life, when you see someone else who's hurt you and betrayed you and sin and their sin has impacted your life, I just encourage you, remember and don't forget how the father ran out to you. How the father came towards you at your lowest low. How the father pursued you when your life was a mess. Because the truth is the same grace that brought you to Jesus is the same grace that keeps you in Jesus. And I think we can somehow think that those two are different. But it's the same. The grace that sustains them and is extended to the person who's making all those decisions that have hurt you is the same grace that's been extended to you when you've hurt others. It's seeing ourselves rightly, understanding our identity rightly. Whether it's in the middle of religion or rebellion, he moved towards you. He moved towards you. So that's the older brother. And I want to go back and and kind of wrap the idea with this little brother in Luke 15 Verse 17. So now we're talking about the little brother. We've talked about posture of older brother. Now posture of little brother. It says this. It's talking about the little brother. And at this point, just to give a little context, the little brother has ran away and he finds himself, he's squandered his inheritance, says he's prostitutes, partying. He's really done his own thing. And he finds himself actually living in a pig pen, which is crazy. It's like the lowest 
of the low is where he found himself living in the mud, eating what the pigs were eating. And it says this, when he came to his senses in verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. So this is the beautiful homecoming when we see the younger son turn from his sin, turn from his ways, turn from his own will. And the younger son has to have a recognition moment, right? He recognizes in the pig pen and in the mud, why am I doing this? Why am I living this way? Why did I squander what my father meant to give me as an inheritance? Why? And I just think that that idea, I want to pause for a moment and talk about that idea of in the middle of the mud, in the middle of the mess, in the middle of recognizing the state of our spirit and our heart that the father ran towards him. Again, there's no unimportant details. The father ran towards him. The father pursued him. The father looked for him. And I just think that someone here needs to hear today that the father is running towards you and has been running towards you your entire life. Every ounce of pain that you have endured has not been on accident. God can actually use the mud and use the mess and the disappointment and the waiting and the pain to actually draw him towards you. He does not waste a tear. He does not waste a moment of pain. He actually uses those moments and in his grace allows us to see ourselves rightly in those moments and see, God, you are the only one that can actually sustain me and fill me and heal me. God, you are the only one who's going to be enough for me. He uses all of that and he runs towards you. And so if you're in the middle of a lifestyle that you know is not pleasing and honoring to God, that is about you and your wishes and your fulfillment and you're in the middle of the cycle of just sin and living your life for you, I just wanna tell you that God is still running towards you and he's never gonna stop. He will never stop chasing you. It is not too far gone. If you're in the middle of anxiety and depression and it almost feels like I'm not even worth it because I don't have hope. How could a God run towards me when I feel this dark and when I feel this far from him? I wanna tell you, He loves you so incredibly much and he has been with you in every single step of anxiety, every single step of depression. He never left you. He never will leave you. And not only that, he doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to heal you. And it might not be an overnight process. It might take some time, but he's running towards you. He's pursuing you. If you don't even know what you believe about God, if you're like, I'm here today And yeah, I'm kind of singing the words, but I don't know that I believe in God. I don't know that I believe all of the stuff about the cross and his blood and new life. Like that sounds crazy. (laughs) Sounds a little, little hard and out of reach for me. I just want to tell you that even if you don't understand him, he understands you and he knows your heart and he's pursuing you and he's looking at you from a long way off. And he's saying, I am here. I'm not far from you. All it takes is for you to turn around and say, I'm here in my mess. I'm here and not fully understanding. I'm here and feeling like I don't get all this religious talk. He's saying, I'm here because I love you. You're not too far from me. He's chasing you and he's seeing you from a long way off. And I think those of us who do know Jesus, I know right now I'm remembering when he did that for me, when he saw me from a long way off when he opened his arms to me, when I was in the middle of a mess, when I didn't deserve second chances and I didn't deserve his love. And that's why it moves me to tears every time I talk about this story because it's not just a story, it's our life and it's our testimony. We serve a God of all things new and we serve a God of second chances and we serve a God who will never stop looking for just you. You're worth everything to him. He went to the cross just for you. You would have been enough for him. Going to the cross just for you is enough for him. That is the love of a father. And I just want to talk really quick because I know we're ready to wrap up and I'm crying and I'm a mess. 
But the internal conversation of this younger brother before he goes back to his father is really important. Before he gets to his dad, he has a plan because he's royally screwed up. He's betrayed his father. He's done everything wrong. He's muddy. He smells bad. His hair is a mess. And he has a plan. He's like, I've got to know what to say. And I can relate to this. I remember coming home late after curfew when I was 16. I have to have something to say. I need to explain to my mom why I'm walking in the door three hours late. And I don't have anything to say, but I'm going to come up with something to say. And this is what the son is doing to his dad. He's saying, okay, I don't actually deserve to come back to your house as a son. I've royally messed up. So what I'll say is allow me back in your house, but as a servant, as a slave, I won't come back as a son. I'll come back as the hired help. And I love this because the son actually gets the first part of his speech right. The correct part is in verse 18. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and sinned against you. And that's right. Sin really just means we've missed the mark. We've hurt our father. We've made the wrong decision. We've done the wrong thing. We've gone our own way. We've put our will above his will, took his grace for granted. He's saying, I'm unclean and I have sinned. And that was a great way to start because you know what, church? God cannot actually reveal and he- or God cannot actually heal what you and I do not reveal and expose. So confessing our sin, recognizing the state of our heart and spirit is actually the first step to take a look inside and say, you know what, God, I need help. I am not in a good place. I am messing it up. That is the first step because then God can take that and do something with it. But we have to recognize it first. God's not going to do much when we say, I'm good. I don't need you. I'm good with where I am. It might not be great, but I'm fine. God's not going to force it on you because he's a loving father. He waits for that invitation to come into our lives. But the younger brother starts off strong in verse 18 when he confesses his sin, but then he gets it wrong in verse 19 when he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He comes to a conclusion about how his father will see him because of his pain, his position, and his sin. He comes to the conclusion of, I am not worth as much because of my sin. He comes to the conclusion that my sin has decreased the value of my life. He comes to the conclusion of, I do not have the same value now as I did at the beginning of my journey. So, Father, just hide me. Just tolerate me. Let me live here, but as a servant, not as a son with an inheritance. And I think that so many of us can still approach God in the same way. Like, God, yeah, I'm I'm a Christian and I'm going to follow you. But because of my past, because of my past divorce, because I'm not outgoing like that person or I don't, I don't, I don't have that personality of like a church person or, or because I, I feel like I'm in this pit of depression and, and a Christian isn't supposed to be in a pit of depression. So because of all of those things, God, just, just tolerate me. But I understand that I'm not the same as your other kids or I'm not as same as her or him. Just tolerate me in your presence, but you don't have to embrace me fully as a son and as a daughter, we can think that our heirs have changed our inheritance. Our behavior has actually changed our birthright. But the truth is, and I want to make this really clear, the difference between servants and sons, servants keep their distance, but sons and daughters have full access. Servants work for compensations, but sons and daughters receive provision. Servants just share a space, but sons and daughters share DNA, share the same blood. Servants are for a season, but sons and daughters are forever. And you are a son and you are a daughter. When we say yes to Jesus, we do not have to approach God as the hired help. We can approach him as a son and a daughter. And I think about my kids, my three kids, they're just perfect. Um, No, they're not perfect. They're far from perfect, but I love them. I love them so much. And I want to tell you that as a mom in my heart, my deepest and greatest desire for my children is not actually just to have perfect behavior. I don't desire them to just do the right thing, to just go through the motions. What I desire and what Nate and I desire most deeply for our children is that they recognize in the depth of their hearts who they are. 
And they are sons and daughters of Jesus. And then when you recognize deep in your heart, I know who I am, your behavior, the decisions you make is actually informed by the recognition of that identity. God is not pursuing your behavior. He is pursuing your heart. He wants you to see more than anything else how he sees you as a son and as a daughter. So the father sees him. And the dad doesn't even let him finish his explanation. I'm not worthy to be called your son. He cuts him off. And in verse 22, the father said to his servants, just stop. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. It's like, let's put the music on, make the food, invite the neighborhood. <laughs> Put the best clothes on, make the table the most beautiful it's ever looked because the son of mine is lost. Verse 24, the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. So they began to celebrate. And again, this is not just one person's story. This is your story. This is my story. If we have found Jesus, if we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God with every, every single one of us had, this is your story and this is mine. And there's so many people out there who this is their story as well, but they don't know it. They don't know that this would apply to them. They don't know that they wouldn't have to earn that. And that's why here in this house, we express joy and thanks and celebration in place of criticism where we give people a welcome and put a robe on and a ring on because we actually want to reflect the heart of God in this house. I know it's a lot sometimes. It's a lot of hugs and it's a lot of smiles and it can be a little overwhelming for some of us. And I get that. But church, I would so much rather go the, so far the other way, turn the music up way too loud, smile too much, hug too much, celebrate too much, because we are called to replicate the heart of the father, not the heart of the older brother, not the heart of the younger brother. You and I are carriers of God's presence. We are called to replicate the heart of the father. This is just culture talk for a second. So when we tell you, hey, invite your friends to come on Sunday, invite your friends to a connect group. We want them to hear about the love of Jesus. That's because there are people who don't know that this is their story and that is their father who loves them and is chasing them and pursuing them that there is hope even if they're in the mud that there is hope even if they're in the middle of hypocrisy and anger in their hearts that there is hope for every single one in this moment we're actually going to do something really special we're actually going to take communion together as a family la santa cena and the ushers are going to be passing that out at this moment and we felt like today was the perfect time to take communion. You know, the scripture says that as Jesus sat down with his disciples before he was to be crucified, they took communion. And he said to his disciples, okay, take this bread, take this wine. This bread is my body broken for you. Do this, take this in memory of me. He did the same with the wine. This is my blood that has been poured out for you. This is my blood that represents our new pact drink this in memory of me and so that's what we're doing today as we're talking about the father who sees us from a long way off a father who has forgiven us a father who has paid for our sins because friends like i said all of this grace and arms open and love and new chances and and and, and fresh starts all of this didn't just happen it was paid for and bought by jesus dying on the cross for us and so we do this in remembrance of him so we're gonna pass out the communion and I just encourage you to take it in your own time as we sing this next song. You can stand, you can sit, whatever you would like to do. If you're here with your, your spouse, I encourage you to grab hands, take it together, pray over each other. But I encourage you to remember the moment when God saw you from a long way off, when he found you and put a robe on you and put a ring on your finger and welcomed you back in his family. I encourage you to just reflect on that for a moment to remember it and thank him as you take the bread and remember his body that was broken as you as you drink the juice and remember his blood wasn't just spilled out for the person to your left or to your right it was out for you he went to the cross for you and we're called to remember and thank him today so take it on your own time as we sing this next song together
thank you, Jesus, for your blood, for your sacrifice. We thank you for the cross and what you did for every single one of us, Jesus. May we never forget. May we never take your grace for granted. May we never live in such a way that does not reflect the deep and genuine gratitude of a heart that was lost and is now found, the deep and genuine gratitude of a life that was literally dead and is now alive. God, refresh our gratitude for your sacrifice. Refresh our gratitude for your son and what you did, Jesus. We love you and we praise you. Thank you for welcoming us into your house. Thank you for setting a place at your table specifically for us. And thank you that there are always more seats at your table, that your grace never runs out, that your love is not proportioned in a way that our human minds can understand, but it is boundless and endless and deeper and wider and more powerful than we could possibly imagine. It is for every single one of us. We thank you. We praise you. And in this moment, I just want to ask everyone here, if not already, just bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to take one more moment to just talk with those of us who are here and don't know Jesus as our father. Haven't invited him and asked him to come into our lives, to transform our hearts, to be our Lord and Savior. If you're here and that is you today, Maybe you've even attended church your whole life. Maybe you've been baptized or maybe this is the first time you've ever stepped in a church and you're not sure about God, whatever it is, whatever your situation and story, again, this is for you. His grace is for you. His new life is for you. His blood was shed for you. And so I just want to extend an opportunity right now. If you want to say yes to Jesus, if you want not religion, but a relationship with your father in heaven who created you, loved you and died for you, Right now is an opportunity and a chance. And if you want to say yes, I'm going to ask you to do something simple but bold. And on the count of three, just raise your hand up in the air. And that's just a, a step of obedience that says, God, I choose you and I want you. I don't want my own way. I want your way. I don't want my own will. I choose yours. So on the count of three, if you want to make that decision today, just go ahead and shoot your hand up in the air. One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to wait just one more moment. God sees you. He sees your life. He sees your heart. He sees every hand. He loves you so much. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask everyone to just place your hand over your heart. And those of us who raised our hands, but also those of us who already know Jesus, we're going to repeat this prayer in agreement with those who accepted him for the first time today. Repeat this prayer with me, dear Jesus. I admit that I've made mistakes. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Today, I give you my heart and my life, Jesus. I don't wanna go my own way, I wanna go your way. I want you to be my savior, my father, my Lord. Give me the power to live for you every single day. 